All right, y'all, as you know, last week I had the opportunity to sit down with the incredible Matthew McConaughey. He's an actor, producer, father, husband, and now he's the New York Times bestselling author of his new book, Green Lights. And we had part one of our conversation last week. Today, we are continuing with part two. Okay, so this makes me think of something that um, stood out to me in your book and even hearing a couple other interviews that you did. You talk about your mom and just the unbelievable level of confidence that she instilled in you. And I, I wanna dig into this because I think a lot of people that listen to this show, Matthew, really, to be honest, they struggle with confidence. And so it's one of those things where they don't wanna be arrogant and they don't wanna seem egotistical, um, you know, and they just, th that's an area they wanna grow in. And I love the story of little Mr. Texas. Am I saying it right? Like you were <laughs> discovered last year, it was run up. You're like, mom, what happened? So talk a little bit about that and just how she built you up in a way that has given you that courage, it seems like, to go for things and be willing to fail and risk it because you realize your identity is not attached to it. It's like, well, let's just try it. Let's just see what happens. Talk right. a little bit about, about that. Right. Well, that story is a great story. I'll tell it. I'll try and tell yeah. it uh, now. So, yeah, 1977, my mom enters me in the Little Mr. Texas contest. So I get my button down. I got my jeans and boots, my belt, my belt buckle. I got this vest. I ride in on a horse. I answer questions <laughs> about ranching and and, and, and respect for elders and what I want to be and do the pageant deal. And all of a sudden, boom, confetti's going off. It's over. I got a trophy in my hand. Wow, <laughs> I've got this thing great. And my mom's like, you did it. You're little Mr. Texas. And all of a sudden we go home and that picture of me holding that trophy is framed on the, on the kitchen wall. And every morning from that day on, when I come into breakfast, she stops. She goes, look at you. There you are, Matthew. You, you are little Mr. Texas. That's 1977. Every day from 77 through 88, which is when I graduated high school, for breakfast, that's what I heard every morning. Well, in 2019, preparing and writing this book, I come across that photo. I'm like, ah, oh, there I am. That's my little Mr. Texas photo. <laughs> that catches my eye on the engravement plate on the trophy. I'm like, what is that? And I zoom in, I look at it, and it says, runner up. <laughs> 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 I was like, Mom, I was a little bit sick. I was running up. She was like, oh, well, that kid who won, his family was rich. They bought him a fancy suit that we couldn't afford, so we call that cheating. You are Little Miss Texas. It was like, uh, and so I always joke, because like, would I be here with the life I have if I had grown up thinking I was a runner-up, you know? Yeah. Um, that's one of those little, you know, white lie malaprops that my mom has a real art for. Yeah. Um, you know, she used to say, because she's a real, she's a real survivor mm -hmm. uh, and not someone who grew up with a family system, a father and a mother system that she could have much of anything to say, I want to do it like them. It was so remiss and so kind of, I'm not, maybe too strong a word to say wrong, but so uh, um, uh, dysfunctional that her only, the reason she became a good mom is she was just so disgusted with how she was raised. She goes, I'm going completely opposite mm. of that. So yeah. she didn't know what she, how to be a mom. She just knew so much of what, how she, what kind of mom she didn't want to be. Right. That she became a great mom. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, she would raise us on on things like, you know, you're nervous, you're about to go out to the to the prom and you're kind of sweating. She's like, what are you sweating about? I was like, oh, I'm nervous. She goes, oh, it's okay to be nervous, but let me say one last thing before you leave. What's that, mom? Don't you walk in that place like you want to buy it. You walk in that place like you own it. I'm like, whoa, okay. Great. I love it. I you love know? it. She told me those words before I went in for my screen test for the final summation in the time to kill that got me that role. It was great things to hear yeah. from a, from a mother, uh, just as far as perspective right. of going in with confidence. Right. Um, look, we had our 89th birthday last night. Um, That's amazing. Happy birthday to her. That's incredible. Because she didn't like the number 89. She says, yeah. I'm looking for 90. I still like number 89. Well, we threw a surprise party. Now, one of the great things about her, and I think this lends to where your question is, she loved making yesterday about her, which it damn well was supposed to be about. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> no false modesty. 
you yeah. know, which is actually a form of condescension sometimes mm-hmm. and false humility. Right. It's like she's able to own going, thank you for celebrating me on my day. And that's honest too, right? Like there's something so yes. honest about that versus that false humility. Like there's yeah, something versus, beautiful uh, in that. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you, 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 it's a beautiful confidence to see and to own that we should respect our, our ourselves. Now, we all know there's ways to overdo it. Some people go through every single day going, this every single thing's about me every day. Right. Well, that can go overboard. And you sure. go, well, you're not taking in context or consideration yeah. anybody else. And it's becoming kind of rude. But boy, when it is yours, I know me, I I, I like to, it's the not knowing yeah. why I succeeded or failed that I don't like. Yeah. I like to do things on my own. So if it works, I go, that was me. Yeah. If it doesn't work, I can go, that was me. That's At least right. I know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I think that's part of why she's able to, or, and someone with that perspective and having that self-respect of, of themselves on their special day or whatever, it's why she's able to respect others more Yeah, too. I, I think, I think it's why she can re- make a bigger deal out of my birthday or someone, one of her friend's mm-hmm. birthday. She'll, she'll make, help people get, you know. But she'll make a friend of hers' birthday be so awesome by sheer force and will that yeah. that person's like, wow. Yeah. Th- th- thank, thank you. I didn't, I wouldn't give myself that much credit. Yeah. You know? It's so, contagious. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love that perspective. I've always thought, even since I was like a teenager, before I even had children, I have three little kids. Now, I think you have three in like middle school. Three. Is that their age? So my my one of the top things I want for them is confidence because you you go further in life you you'll take more risk you'll walk into a room and 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 look someone in the eye you know just all the things that withstand peer pressure all the things that come with it but it almost reminds me of what you just said of the leveling up you know what I mean like bringing things right. down to eye level and going all right you know like this is yep. I can I can have this conversation I can go for this thing walk in this room like you own it I tell people all the time to fake it until you feel it you don't feel confident that's okay throw your shoulders back hold your head high and just fake it till you do you know yeah and, and you know and if you get busted it's okay oh well <laughs> yeah God caught me Boop. yeah yeah Guilty. Oh, oh, well. I was posing that you know what I mean? yeah. yeah totally okay so I so on the opposite end of the spectrum you had this amazing mom that instilled confidence in you, you know, spoke that over you. You lived in that truth. You've got those reminders all through your life. You went through something a few years ago where you decided to stop doing rom-coms. You were mm-hmm. the rom-com guy. You were everybody's favorite romantic comedy guy. And you decided to change courses. And that was a really brave thing. I'm sure it was a scary thing at the time. Talk a little bit about what that was like. And, you know, did you did you ever doubt yourself, you know, when things weren't, scripts weren't coming in? Like, talk about that season, because that's pretty recent, and I think that'd be amazing for people to hear what that's been like yeah. for you. So, I was, uh, this is about I don't know, 12 years ago, I was, had had quite a few successful rom, romantic comedies, um, and I had become the go-to rom right. com guy. They're medium, large, they're medium budget, large studio films. They were making a lot of their money back. I was getting paid handsomely. All the audiences were going to see them. They were fun to do. They were easy to do. I liked doing them. Um, But I noticed that that became sort of the only thing that was coming my way. Jigging was fine. I was fortunate and happy about that. But there were other things I wanted to do. There was some dramatic fare I wanted to do that when I would circle around it or try to, you know, get in one of those movies, the studios would be like, no, no, we're not financing that with, with Kane. You, you're the, you're the rom-com guy. And I was like, ah, okay. Um, so I also remember reading rom-com scripts and I remember reading it tonight and going, oh, I could do this tomorrow morning. Mm-hmm. And I remember going, I want to find some work that I'm going, I read it and I go, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. Yeah, but challenge. I'm find it out. Yeah. So I said, all right, if I can't do what I want to do, I'm going to stop doing what I've been doing. So I had a talk with Camilla. There were tears all over the floor about them because we understood this was a major risk. I mean, I was stepping out of the, of a lane that I had great ownership of in Hollywood, um, the rom-com lane, and they were paying me handsomely. And they were, that money was renting the houses on those beaches that I was running shirtless and surfing on. Yes, that was <laughs> damn right it was. Yeah. Um, and none of that regrettable, all that absolutely. So, I said, if I can't do what I what I want to do, I'm gonna stop doing what I've been doing. So I talked to Camilla, I talked to my agent, I talked to my money man. My money saved it well because I'd say I might not go with work, might not have work for I don't know how long. And I stopped. 
moved to Texas. No one knows where I am, but the rom-com scripts keep coming in with offers. I read, no. I read, no thank you. Read, no thank you. Read, no thank you. After about six months, and finally I turned down one that was for $14.5 million, an offer, and said no thank you to that. When I said no thank you to that one at $14.5 million, I think it sent a little bit of a lightning bolt through Hollywood going, oh, McConaughey's not bluffing. Yeah, he's, he's serious. really not doing these, yeah. okay? Um, so then nothing came in. For the next 14 months, nothing. I call my agent weekly. He goes, buddy, I don't even, I don't remember the last time I heard your name. And every time I hear your name, they go, no, thank you. Well, it did. But at the same time, it started giving me, started building momentum in my sabbatical. It's sort of like, I was like, it's a bit like that Australian trip I took the whole year. It was like, (laughs) pull a parachute after three weeks, come back. I was starting to gain like, oh, no, no. The longer I'm in this, the more penance I'm paying. (laughs) I'm gaining strength here. I'm gaining courage. I'm gaining identity. I'm being forced to be an underdog. I'm being forced on an island. Now, it was wobbly. You know, there were, you know, it started to, to... peek at the old, peek at the bottle maybe before six o'clock sometimes and go, yeah. the days were long, right. you know, I don't have work. Where was right. my significance, et cetera, et cetera. But I had a newborn to look after, which was uh, sort of a, I remember to let my, it became obvious very early that, okay, if you don't have this, these things to work on, that is your livelihood and your career. If you just put your attention on your newborn son, you can't go wrong. That's yeah. a great place to put. Yeah. All of your attention at any time. You can't do too much of that. Yeah. Um, so that helped. There was a um, there was a family crisis outside of my immediate family that that appeared, and you know how it happens when those ha- when those happen. Whether I even even if I was working doing the work mm-hmm. I was wanting to do, right. the, there's kind of crisis that comes up where the world the rest of the world stops and you right. go, guys, see you later. I got to right. go handle this, and it's right. it's it's clear. You right. know, there's no question about it. So. I was finding purpose in those things. And right about that time when I had, wasn't even really thinking about going back to Hollywood, I was already like, I'll, I'll decide. I may change careers. I'll go do something else. But I'll deal with that after I finish dealing with this family crisis. Yeah. Well, guess what shows up? Lincoln Lawyer, Killer Joe, Paperboy, Magic Mike, True Detective, Mud, Bernie, Dallas Buyers Club. The 20 months that I was gone that I was not in your living room, in your theater, in a rom-com, that you did not see another picture of me on the beach shirtless. It was, where'd McConaughey go? Yeah. So for 20 months, I gained anonymity again. And now became a new novel, interesting, original, good idea for one of these drums. Yeah. <laughs> they looked and, at it differently. Like, yeah. And when they came, I was ferocious about it. I said, I know exactly what I want to do. This is it. Let's line them up and let's knock them out. I love it. And it's amazing. You tell so many of those stories in this book, like uh, when you talked about Dallas Buyers Club, and um, and I think you've referenced this in some other interviews too, but just not even having the budget, showing up on day one, doing the thing in 25 days. Like it's just, it's insane what you've been able to do with just such uh, tenacity and commitment and persistence, which has just been incredible to watch. I'm so grateful that you wrote this, and I'm so grateful that you recorded it on audio, because it's so fun uh-huh. to listen to you with, like, the unbel- like you are acting the whole thing out. You feel like you're there. Uh, before we wrap up, because I know we have to respect your time, you've got more interviews, um, I've got some random rapid-fire questions before we wrap up. Is that okay with you? Yeah. All right, let's do it. Number one, what is your favorite movie line you've ever had? All right, all right, all right. Oh, so good. I did not know until I listened to the book that that was the first line you ever said on film and you made it up and you weren't written it. You weren't supposed to be in that scene. Such uh, a cool, such a cool backstory. Okay. Favorite movie line you wish you had. Favorite movie line I wish I had. Um, don't know the line. It's a scene in the okay. film adaptation where Nicolas Cage, the actor, is talking to Nicolas Cage, the actor who's playing the other actor, and he's telling him the meaning of love. Oh. Check it out. It's a it's about a two minute scene. Okay. It's beautiful about unconditional love. It's oh, a story good. where you know one brother saying to the other brother, um, you know how you've always gone through life just not regretting or not 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 or being able to forgive people for things like what about that girl? What's her name? Barbara in high school that said you know you when you asked her to go to the prom she said yeah. 
And then um, she said, meet me in front of the lockers. And she had all her friends there. And they all started laughing, going, she was never going to go with you. <laughs> and you brushed it off your back like water off a duck's back. And the brother tells him, well, it wasn't about Barbara. I did, I did, I did love Barbara. It wasn't about oh. her saying yes to me to go to the prom or not. I mean, I wish she would have said, yeah, but it wasn't yeah. about her making fun of me. I still dug her. Oh. regardless of how she felt about me. And it's a really wow. beautiful, much much wow. more poetic than I just said it, but it's yeah. a beautiful parable about love. I love that. It's so deep. I love it. Okay. Um, best part of 2020 for you? Family. It's good. Okay. Thing you're looking most forward to for 2021? Revelation and revivals. Oh, I like that. Okay. First thing you do when you wake up? Stretch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One thing you can't live without. Music. Uh, that's good. I like this. I like this. All right. Last one. The number one thing you hope people take away from this book. Hey, that place we want to get individually and as people and as neighbors and as states and countries and believers and non-believers and everything. In this life, there's no final destination. There's not a ta-da moment. We don't arrive at anything in this life and go, ah, oh, finally, I got it. No, that result is unattainable. If we can look at life as the game that we can keep constantly chasing that result, maybe escalating, get just a little bit better, a little bit closer every day and understand and shake hands with the fact that that's the process, that's as good as it gets. That's the end game in this life. Then we stay in the race, we commit to the chase, that's as good as it gets. I love it. These really are the good old days. This is such an awesome book. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for recording it. Thank you for sharing this side of your life and your story with us. Uh, I know so many people are finding such hope and just uh, also feeling inspired to live their own story in a better way. So thanks for being here. Thanks for hanging out with us, Matthew. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thanks.